and welcome to the Lynn House Kitchen. Today we're going to be talking about fabric dyeing. If you've seen some of the other videos that I've done, we've worked with wool and we've spun wool and then we've also worked with the wool and we've woven it into uh, blankets and carpets. But now we're going to actually dye some of the wool. Can you imagine a world without color? All of your clothing would be plain white or maybe a brown color. Wouldn't you like to introduce some color into your life? Well, the Victorians also like to have color in their clothing. And in fact, when you look at photos, you see everything in black and white and you think that maybe their clothing was pretty dull. But when you see real Victorian clothing in a museum, you will see the beautiful bright colors that they wore. The definition of dyeing is the application of pigments to textiles or fibers. Originally, dyes were made with natural mixture of water and oil to decorate the skin, jewelry, clothing. It was first recorded in 26,000 BC in the Neolithic age. Colors were made from plants, leaves, roots, flowers, insects like cochineal, sea life like mollusks, and minerals like copper. Yellow is the most common color. Purple changed history of fabric. It was very expensive to make and became a status symbol. Roman emperors wore purple. This was achieved by crushing thousands of shells of a mollusk called murex found in the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. Blue was another color. It was made from wad, which is a plant, and indigo, as well as matter red. These were found in Asia and Europe and were introduced to the colonies through trade. The first synthetic organic dye was made in 1856 by William Henry Perkin. He made it by accident. He was actually looking for a treatment for malaria and he was experimenting with coal tar. This was called Movine or Perkins Mauve. This led to the collapse of the natural growth of matter. By 1870, natural dyes were starting to disappear and more synthetic dyes were being invented. Today, 90% of clothing is dyed synthetically. Talking about Victorians, we always have to talk about the green arsenic dye. In 1775, Swedish chemists Carl Wilhelm Schleim invented a bright green dye. It was a jewel-like tone. It was also called emerald green. At this time too, we are getting away from candlelight and now we're starting to have coal oil lamps and gas lit in the Victorian times. And so colors were more easy to see. Everyone wanted to wear this brilliant, bright emerald green because it shone beautifully at balls and was an exotic color to wear. But it did contain arsenic, which is a deadly chemical. It was used in clothing, they used it in wallpaper, they used it in carpeting, they used it in paintings. William Morris, the famous wallpaper and printmaker, created stunning wallpaper design using this green pigment. Monet and Renoir painted with it. It gave a beautiful lush green landscapes for the factory workers who were using this dye on a daily basis. It was very deadly to them. And we've all heard some terrible stories about wearing this dye in our clothing and children crawling on carpets that had this dye and becoming very ill. People continued to wear it. They thought, oh, if I just wear it just once, it's not gonna give me any harm. It's not gonna hurt me. And it took a very long time for the vanity of this beautiful green for them to stop wearing it and using it in their household items. So you'd like to do some dyeing, some natural dyeing with some of the things that you might find here around Lynn House Museum. We grew beets last year. And so this is some dye that's been made with the beetroot. We have a lot of black walnut trees. And so here is a piece of wool fabric that's been dyed with black walnuts. I have also been dyeing with some onion skins. So we have just the skins of the onions. And then I've been experimenting and this was avocado. I was supposed to get a lovely little pink color, 
But as you can see, dying is not an exact science. So you may never get what you think you're going to get. So what co equipment do you need if you want to do some dyeing at home? Well, of course you need your dye stuff. So here we have some vegetable matter and uh, some nuts from a tree. You're going to need a pot and then you're going to need a stove. Now I like to do my dyeing outside. So I just have a little hot plate that I like to use just because I just don't like having some odd smells in my house. So most of my dyeing is done in the nicer weather. I also use a scale because I want to weigh my fabric, but you don't really need to have one. This is just an old kitchen scale that I had at home. The one thing I want to mention to you is that if you're going to do any dyeing, whether it be natural or using chemical dyes or um, acid dyes, that you designate all your equipment just to use it for dyeing. Don't use it for cooking or anything else. So all of this equipment is only used for dyeing. It's not used for food preparation. You need to have some solid rubber gloves, not just little latex types, just because you will be dealing with some items that are hot. And also too, you don't want to get the dye on your skin. An apron is helpful if you don't want to uh, get your clothing ruined as well. A set of hot pads so that you can lift things in when they're hot. Again, separate jars and stir sticks. I have spoons that I just use for this purpose. Old wooden spoons, when they were dying outside, they would use uh, just a stick that was around and things that they would find around like their onion skins, old pots, uh, and put it over an open fire. I have some tongs for moving things around. Again, if I'm dying a lot with fleece, so I don't want to agitate it. Uh, I'm dying a lot with yarn. Again, I don't want to felt it. So um, you just want to make sure that your fiber is submerged into the dye liquid. I have other sticks that I use as well. You know, anything I find that I can use. You want a strainer. I actually like this type of a strainer because when I strain things, this fits nice over um, sinks or pots or even this nice plastic bucket. And you will need plastic containers to strain things in and to uh, put things in as well. And now also too, you need things to dry it with. Clothing uh, racks over fences. Um, if I lived on the farm, I would hang my fleece just over a, a wooden fence, um, a drying rack. But at home, I use just an old screen that I've scavenged from around the neighborhood. So now you have your equipment. You have you, the fabric that you need to dye with. You're, you want to, especially if you're going to do natural dyeing, you want to use natural products. So like wool, cotton, silk, uh, things like that. They'll absorb the dye better. Synthetic material doesn't absorb the dye as well. And it may wash out. It may not stay in your dye product. And you need a Morton. So a Morton is something that will affix to the fabric as well as to the dye. So the dye that you have in the pot as well as onto the fabric. So it will bind the two together. And there are many household items you can use as Mortons. Vinegar is one. Salt is another. I use a lot of alum. At one time it was used for pickling. It's great as a mortant for dyeing. Also, I use cream of tartar. So these are the main things that I use. A mortant can also be the vessel that you prepare your dye in. If I had an iron pot, that could be my mortant. An, an aluminum pot, a tin pot, a copper pot. All of those things can change the color of your dye. So in this jar, I have some iron, some old iron. Uh, you can use rusty nails. I just happen to have some large pieces of, of iron around. And this is a 50-50 mixture of uh, vinegar to water. And what I'm making is an iron bath. So I don't have an iron pot that I want to make my dye in. So I'm going to experiment with some iron water. What I'll do is at the end of a dyeing process, then I will add some iron water to it. And what the iron water will do, it will satin the color. So it will make it a little duller. So another good thing to experiment with. 
So I have done some experimenting with um, different dyes. So these three here, the 100% wool, this is what the natural color of it looked like down here. So this is not quite white. It's a little greeny gray color. I had a nice piece of wool fabric and I have a piece of cotton fabric. So I wanted to experiment to see how things would turn out when I use different products. So this is calendula. Calendula is a flower. And when I mentioned earlier about yellow being one of the most common colors, when you have a flower, you think you're going to get pink or uh, whatever the color of the flower is, most likely you're going to get this green yellow kind of color from any of the flowers that you use. So again, three different types. This is hand spun wool. Uh, this is a commercial uh, wool and this is just fleece. So they're all similar tones but there are some little differences to them. So this is calendula. We actually grow this here at the Lynn House Kitchen Garden. This one is the Dyer's Chamomile, also known as Golden Marguerite. This one is black tea. So you just need to steep the tea and then soak your fabric in it and you will get this lovely tea color. Depending on the type of tea, this one I've used black, but you can use all sorts of different types of tea and you'll get different shades. This is the black walnut, that a larger piece of wool here, some yarn, again, a smaller sample of wool and some cotton. This was another experiment I had. This one is a uh, black bean. It was supposed to come sort of a blue color. I'm gonna continue to experiment with this and maybe change the pot. I mentioned that the type of pot you use and possibly the type of word that I use, I'm hoping to get sort of a gray blue color by using black beans. So I'm gonna try that one again. This one is a sample of the red matter. And I mentioned that with the introduction of synthetic dyes, the red matter plant was then not being produced as much. So this is the red that people would normally get if they used a red matter. And this one down here is a dandelion. Last year, I think uh, I picked all the tops off of the dandelions and boiled up a batch and I got this sort of yellow color. So now you have all the products that you need to actually do some dyeing and you want to actually dye something. So I'm going to make some onion dye. You're going to take off the skins. I save up until I have a little mound of them. And then I'm going to boil them in a pot of water and I'm going to boil them for about an hour. Then I'm going to use my strainer and strain off those onion skins. Now I want to dye my fabric. So there's many different ways of dyeing the fabric. I have my dye liquid now. It's drained off the product, whether it be onion skins, whether it be the beets, I just have the liquid now. When I want to do some dyeing, I have some options. I can mordant my fiber first, soak it in the mordant for overnight, and then the next day put it into the dye bath. Or I can do, which I usually do, is I make a mixture of the mordant and once my dye bath is ready, I also soak the fiber I'm going to use and get it soaking wet for about at least half an hour. And so it makes sure that all the fiber absorbs water. Again, it's a warm water, not too hot. And then I add the Morton to my dye bath. So I have onion skins in here. I'm going to um, add some alum and some uh, cream of tartar. There's many different recipes you can find on internet uh, for the onion skins that I did. I used two tablespoons of alum and uh, two teaspoons of cream of tartar. Then I put it into my dye bath, make sure it's all dissolved, dissolve it with some hot water. And then I take my wet fiber that I've drip dry through my strainer and then I add my wet fiber into my dye bath, gently pushing it down with um, there. No, I don't want to agitate it too much, so I'm going to gently push it into the dye bath. And now I'm going to again simmer this for about an hour. And then after I simmer it for an hour, I'm going to take it off the heat and I'm going to let it cool till it's completely cool. Then I remove my fiber and now I need to rinse it and you will rinse it again in not 
cold water, not um, hot water. You just want a nice temperature water. What you won't, don't want to do, especially if you're using wool, is you don't want to have temperature shocks. So you don't want to go from cold to hot. So keep the temperatures around the same. And now I'm going to rinse it until the water runs absolutely clear. Because if you're going to use this to knit with or to spin, then you don't want the dye coming off on you, on your hands, or on the product when you wear it. Once the product then is all rinse clear, then I'm gonna take out my screens and I'm gonna lay it on the screen so that I can air dry it, make it nice and fluffy, and I'm going to air dry it, and I usually dry it outside. Um, I have two screens, so I'll put another screen on top so it won't blow away in the wind, and then I flip them over, and it may take a number of days for it to dry. I also dry sometimes just over the laundry tubs in the basement, or you could dry over the, the bathtub if you prefer. So all these areas you can just make sure and just flip it so that it keeps drying and you want it completely dry before you store it. So one of my favorite things to do, as you can see, you know, you want to get like bright red color and the beets are not going to give me that beautiful red color, that Christmas red color that I want. So how am I going to get that? I could use acid dyes. I could use dyes like Rick dye that you can buy in fabric stores. But what could I use that might also be around my house that maybe I don't have to go out and purchase? Well, you can use Kool-Aid. So here's some Kool-Aid that I've used to dye with. Now I have more of a bright red Christmas red color using this Kool-Aid. You have to use the plain Kool-Aid that doesn't have the sugar in it. And then you just add the fabric to the warm water. You can heat it in the microwave. So you can put this in a bowl, in a microwave safe bowl with the Kool-Aid and then fill it with some water and then float your product in it, whether you want to use uh, fleece or yarn and uh, you can put that in it again, submerge it, put it in the microwave for about five minutes, let it sit for a bit, re-microwave it again for another three minutes and then let it cool, completely cool and this is what you'll get. And what will happen is what you're looking for is you're looking for the, the water in the bowl will be completely clear and all of the dye will have gone into the fabric. So that is exactly what happened here. This one was a nice light pink Kool-Aid and I actually put it outside. I didn't do any heating with this at all in the microwave. I just put it in the jar, put it outside and this is just a darker version. Let it sit for a week and this week even being cold you can see that the color now is completely into the fabric and none is left floating around. And I'm hoping that again in a week, that's the same thing's going to happen to this. I have another piece of wool in here along with some yarn as well. So I'm hoping to get the same results from that. And then we had some purple. Then I was playing around with doing colors, different colors. So here we have a mix of colors. And again, I put it in a microwave in a dish and I had put some orange on some areas and some blue Kool-Aid on another area. And there is some light yellow in there too. And again, the same thing, microwave for five minutes, let it cool a bit, microwave it again for three minutes, let it cool completely. And this is uh, the color that I got. Again, you have to rinse it completely once it's absorbed all the color to make sure that none of the color is coming out of it. But you might want to do something even more fun. How about something to wear? I had a white t-shirt and I did some tie dyeing. Wrapped the t-shirt in some elastics and I had two jars and the pink that was in this one same color went in this way and this color that's why i have some leftover of this one went in this way and then i microwaved it the same way let it cool hung it outside in the air and you don't have to microwave it you could just dye it and then dry it and then you could heat set it by ironing it and then we have a nice tie-dye shirt 
Just remember, don't wash it with your regular laundry. Wash it separate, hand wash it, because it may still keep losing some of the dye. This is a nice ball of wool that a friend of mine has made. It's like a speckled dye. And again, she's done it in the microwave. I think she used more of an acid type dye and using uh, something a little syringe. She just dropped colors in the dish and then microwaved it. And then you can get more of a, a speckled look to your yarn. You could do that with a t-shirt as well. So I hope that uh, this has piqued your interest in doing some uh, natural dyeing or dyeing with Kool-Aid or maybe even some acid or other types of dye. Just remember to work safely and appreciate all the work that had to go into adding color to your clothing. I thank you for joining me today and I hope you have fun doing some dyeing.